Okay, so I'm Jim Finn, and we're live at Sessions on the River. Thank you for all the support today, and uh, Chris Curry is producing and doing a great job. So thanks for everyone that came out tonight. Right now we have a really special performance. Sarah Murphy Dyson is the performer, and the piece is called Naked Ballerina. I can tell you, a friend of mine, Aaron Berger, uh, called one day, and he says, hey, you want to go check out a play in Hamilton? I'm like, uh, no, play Hamilton? No. In my head, that's what I thought, but I said yes. And I didn't know why, and I've been getting much better at saying yes without knowing the reason why. And uh, so uh, it was a moving experience for me. Um, Sarah really gets into some personal details and makes herself very vulnerable, and I was so moved by it. And my niece, who's here tonight, again, <laughs> thank you, Brooke. I was just like, and Brooke has to see this. She's a dancer. She's actually in dance college now, and just... So proud of both of you. And so I came back the next night with my niece, and then I was moved to tears because you, you now you can see it coming. And, and so I'm just so honored to have Sarah here tonight to perform this bit for you. And uh, so without further ado, I'll get off the stage. And this is The Naked Ballerina by Sarah Murphy Dyson. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there lived a princess. From the time she was very young, the princess felt sad and alone. But when she cried, all the doors to the castle slammed shut, and the princess was afraid. So she made a beautiful mask, adorned with her mother, the queen's favorite jewels. When she put on the smiling mask, the doors in the castle opened, and everyone in the royal court praised her beauty and surrounded her with sweetness and laughter. The princess was grateful for the company. But that night, when she looked at her reflection in her golden mirror, she could not recognize herself. Princess, just in my best, smiling for you, the way that you want me to save me. Oh my god, I didn't know you guys were here yet. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh, did you just hear that? Oh, I'm sorry, ew, my voice is all nasal and oh my god. Okay, before y'all run out of here screaming, hi, <laughs> I'm Gwyn. It's really nice to meet you. I'm so glad you're here. Okay, so yeah, my name's Gwyn and I'm a dancer, ballet, <laughs> and that's who I am. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so glad you guys are here. I didn't know if you would come or not, just because I don't know, I'm just being stupid, as usual. Oh my gosh, I feel like such a frump compared to you guys. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to get my breakfast, and uh, we'll just keep on going. <laughs> oh, my God, sorry. <laughs> I did not need to see that. <sighs> mm. Oh, this isn't all I had for breakfast. <sighs> no. No, I had, like, tons of stuff before you guys got here. Like, a huge breakfast. I know, everyone thinks dancers don't eat, right? Well, some dancers are like totally psycho about food, but not me, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So this is definitely not all I had for breakfast. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of dancing, these are my point shoes. It's kind of a love-hate relationship because they look pretty, but they can really hurt. So it's my job not to let you know when I'm hurting. Can't ruin the illusion. <laughs> I mean, I guess they kind of define me in a way because I've been dancing my whole life, so who am I without them, really? Oh, okay, um, so I'm gonna get to class, but you're welcome to stay here if you want to. I mean, I don't want you to feel like you have to or anything, but I'd really love it if you did. But, but I don't want to put any pressure on you or anything, so do what you want. Oh. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. You're not going to all talk about me after I leave, are you? Oh, sorry, just being stupid again. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Bye. Today was a 
amazing. I love it here. Today we were walking down Church Street and these gay guys were like, ooh, look at all the bunheads. Hi girls. And we were like, hi. And we ran away slapping. It was so funny. I don't know how they knew we were dancers, but they did. I don't know how we knew they were gay, but we did. And then we went to Pizza Pizza and I was telling everyone how I'd never even heard of the school when I auditioned. Can you believe it? Who hasn't heard of the National Ballet School? It's the National Ballet School. It was so embarrassing. And then we were talking about how I had my first kiss in the courtyard, my first summer school, and how I wasn't homesick at all, but I didn't tell my parents because I didn't want to hurt their feelings. And I had two pieces of pepperoni pizza and orange panta, and it was so good. Okay, I'm gonna tell you something, but this is so embarrassing, you have to promise not to tell anyone, because I would like, I would seriously die if anybody found out. Okay, and I can't tell you who it was, but I can tell you it was all girls, and they all live in res. Okay, we made Jordan, come into our room and show us his penis. <laughs> and he let us poke it with a hanger so we could see it get hard. <laughs> so we just kept poking it and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he just stood there with his arms crossed and let us poke it. He said he didn't mind at all. <laughs> Do not tell anyone that. Last weekend I had to sleep over at Amy's house. It was so fun and guess what? Her mom let her have coffee. Can you believe it? She's so cool. We watched Eddie Murphy Delirious. It was so funny. Have I mentioned how much I love it here? I want to be a professional dancer here, for sure. And I'm going to be a senior next year. Great, no, I can't believe it. Oh my gosh, have I mentioned how much I love AHA? Take On Me is like the best song ever. It makes me cry, but only because I love it so much. Okay, I better go call home because it's almost lights out. Kirk Cameron and Michael J. Fox say goodnight. <laughs> Good night, diary. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>
His mom was there cleaning, but what I'm not sure. The house was a mess and it smelt really bad. You can guess how his room was, so dusty and gross that I couldn't sit down. I made myself, though. He would feel really bad if he knew that his room made me sick. Then he kissed me. And next thing I knew, he was lying on top of me, sticking his thing at me, sticking it in. And pain ripped right through me, and all I could think is, your mom's right downstairs, and I want this to stop. And poison was all I could smell, suffocating me slowly and sweetly. I went to the bathroom and saw bright red blood on my thighs and my panties. I tried to stop crying and scrubbed at the poison that lingered no matter how hard that I tried. I looked through my tears at my little girl self in the mirror and said, you're a woman now. It felt like a lie, but I had stains to prove it, so I smiled and said it, which made it sound true. Then I went to the bedroom and said it to him, and he tossed me a jaguar, fresh off the hood of some poor rich man's car, and I thought I was going to throw up. That sick feeling stayed with me all through my teens. I just wanted to stay in bed or be dead. But I smiled and danced my way through high school instead and didn't let anyone know. A postscript to this is that Cro-Magnon car criminal who deflowered me, well, it turns out that he's gay. Yeah, he prefers men, but he made me a woman that day I sat down on his bed. And I think I might die when I feel how that poison-filled day permeated my soul. And I still can't help wondering, why? inside of me. I don't want to poison them, so I push it all way deep down and I hide it underneath all my happiness. Usually I can hide it really well. I can even forget it's there sometimes because I am really happy. Well, you know that. I already told you that. And besides, I'm sure it's just obvious. But it's weird, you know. Sometimes being so happy feels like a responsibility. Like, if I don't make sure everybody's happy and everybody knows how happy I am, then what am I even here for, you know? Who knew being so happy could be so fucking miserable? <laughs> Please don't tell anyone about this. I mean, it's no big deal, but... Please? I guess everyone has their own dirty secret. That makes me feel a little bit better. I just hope you aren't... I just hope you aren't too disappointed in me. <laughs> Ding 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 Oh no 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 Gwyn! You must to be no crying! You must to be big smiling! Good girl! Oof! Why are you so big belly? You Santa Claus? No! You ballerina! You must to be like dizzy! Oh, good girl. No more big belly. Now must to be big smiling. Good girl. (laughs) 
Oh, look, it's Gwyn. What's with your hair? A bun? The Nutcracker? <laughs> Hi, my name's Gwyn, and I'm a ballet dancer. Do you like my stupid hair and my welfare clothes? Oh, check me out, I'm flat as a board. <laughs> oh, do you guys smell something? Go practice your ballet, Gwyn. Oh, are you gonna cry? Oh! <laughs> it's allergies. No, stop, stop, stop. Gwyn, why do you keep biting your lips like this? It looks terrible. You think anybody's gonna wanna pay to see that? No, Gwyn's group again, please, and. Stop, stop. Gwyn, I don't understand why you're ignoring me. Can you hear me, Gail? Did you hear what I said? Gail heard what I said. Did you hear what I said? Okay, everybody heard what I said, Gwyn. Look who's at the door, half the grade 12 class. You think they wanna see you dancing around with no lips? No. Twins group again, please. And stop. Gwyn, I don't understand why you're ignoring me. You can't feel it? Okay. Okay. I have a solution. You don't want to show us your lips. We want to see your lips. This way, you can keep doing what you want to do, and the rest of us get to see a normal face. Girls, come up here, please. Okay, Gwyn, one more time from the top. Yes, by yourself. And. The beautiful mask took on a life of its own. The jewels on it shone brighter, and the smile grew wider, even as the princess felt sadder inside. She was married to a prince whose mask was as handsome as hers was beautiful, and people would come from miles around to watch the two of them perform for the court. As they bowed in the warm glow of their audience's delight, the prince would put his arm through hers. But when they were alone, they lay facing away from each other on opposite ends of their bed, and the space between them felt vast. When the princess cried, the tears trapped behind her mask flowed down into her belly, where they hardened into a cold black diamond that jabbed into her all of the time. Eventually, she forgot how it had gotten there, and believed that it had always been a part of her, that it was her. Mask on the outside, diamond on the inside, nothing in between. Dear diary, I did it. I'm married. <laughs> Can you believe it? Me neither. Like, I'm a missus? Seriously? I have a husband? I'm 22. <laughs> don't get me wrong, it was super romantic and everything, although I don't have a ring yet because we were only, only engaged for three days. We were in Puerto Rico and already asked me and I totally wasn't expecting it and honestly, diary, I kind of freaked out. I didn't mean to or anything, but my stomach just flipped and all I could say is I'm way too young. And Artie's face just dropped and I felt so bad for ruining the moment. So I thought about it and I realized that probably one day we might get married. So why not here where it's hot and beautiful and everything? See, I told you it was romantic. And also the newspaper came and did a story on us. Can you believe it? I got like 10 copies for my parents. Oh, speaking of my parents, it turned out that not only did we get married on my grandma's birthday, which meant so much to my mom, but also when we called to tell them, it turned out that it was my other grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, so everybody was there. 
So my mom was like, Artie and Gwyn got married. And everybody went nuts. They were so happy. <sighs> so yeah, I'm a missus. God, that sounds so weird. That is definitely gonna take some time to get used to. But that's normal, right, diary? Please tell me that's normal. Ooh, never mind. I'm just being dramatic as usual. It was all really great. I feel really good about it. I really, really do. <laughs> and everyone is so happy. And that article is so cool. I can't wait to show them. Okay, well, thanks for listening, diary. Love, Mrs. G. Ooh. I'm afraid when I step on the stage that I'll know I can't do it and fall on my face. Monday's child full of grace. But at least I can go for a drink when it's over. The curtain goes up and the music begins. And outside, I'm like, yeah, here we go, blah, blah, blah. But inside, my guts are contorting in knots and I'm sure I will die when I enter stage right. Loose hugs and tight compliments drift through the heavy perfume sprayed so thick, all you see is the sweetness that permeates all of our lives and disguises the sour smell of fear and our feet. Each hair is slicked back in its place and my face is a thick mask of drag queen perfection. My tutu is done up just right, it is tight, so it looks like I might have a waist, not a barrel-shaped torso like one teacher told me. My poor ugly toes are all taped. I'm obsessed with your toes, by the way. I can't help it. I stare all the time like at ladies with perfectly pedicured toes that are smooth and just little, like cute chubby shrimp, and they look like they smell good, you know what I mean? Like with mine, they just look like they stink. Now, back to backstage where it's almost my entrance. I'm in the wings jumping and trying to breathe. I get like a teaspoon and try to control the thoughts screaming inside me, like you're gonna fall and fuck everything up. So I push all my fear and my weakness back down deep inside where I hide it and bare all my teeth in my signature smile so that everyone thinks that I'm happy and calm. But inside I'm screaming, you have to be perfect or else they won't love you. Why bother to try? So I amp up the smile, I wipe off my tears, I suck in my gut, I point my toes harder and quietly enter stage right. Why put myself through that? I think it's kind of like an affair or an abusive relationship or, or a drug addiction. It's all extremes, highs and lows. Just when I think I can't take it anymore, I get sucked back in, seduced by the highs. There's this one ballet, Serenade. I don't even know if I can do it justice. It's to Tchaikovsky's Serenade for Strings which on its own is enough to break your heart. But when combined with all the elements, it's incredible. The music brings the curtain up and there's 24 of us standing, feet together, right arms raised, wrists slightly flexed as though to block the sun from our eyes. Our hair is slicked into high buns and we're all in long, icy blue tutus and it's backlit so everything glows. Chins lifted, eyes straining to see beyond our fingertips and the music swells. Ba 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 And the violins leave us no choice but to tear our gaze from that fixed spot so that our wrists are pulled across the ceiling, the sky, tracing a path through invisible stardust and mist droplets that trail off our fingertips until our eyes reach the floor and the back of our wrist quietly touches our right brow, shielding us from whatever we need protection from. That exquisite journey takes eight counts. Eight counts. A lifetime communicated through eight counts of music. And then we're off for 33 glorious minutes where nothing else matters. And I lose myself in the music and the lights and the beauty of it all. And then all too soon, we're thanking the audience as they're thanking us. And the curtain comes in and I hobble back to my dressing room and get ready to face real life again. <laughs> Gwyn! Oh my god, you are stunning. <laughs> are you happy? You should be. You know, it's really funny, but when I heard you were doing this role, 
couldn't understand it. I, I just I, I just couldn't picture you in this role. <laughs> so weird. But you were really good. I mean it. <laughs> yeah. I saw that I saw that like mess up in the middle, but I'm sure nobody else noticed. You were you were stunning. You really were. Are you happy? Because you should be. Yeah. Okay, you go get yourself a drink. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh my gosh, Gwen, you are so good. <laughs> You're like my favorite dancer. Could you please sign my program? <laughs> I want to be just like you when, you when I grow up. I have all the posters of you and Artie in my bedroom. You guys are like perfect. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Oh my God, you were fabulous. Come with me. There's some people I want you to meet. They're dying to meet you. <laughs> Here she is. Isn't she gorgeous? She's one of our favorites. Her and her husband are on all the posters. Where is Artie anyway? Oh, there he is. Wow, your parents must be so proud. What a couple you are. <laughs> Ooh, are you from the newspaper? Could you please take a picture of us with Gwen? She and her husband are just fabulous. Oh, they would love to, Gwen. You wouldn't mind doing another interview with Artie, would you? They want the magic couple. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we won't keep you. Why don't you go get yourself some food? Or do you eat? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. <sighs> hey, Artie. I was just talking to Sandy. She was looking over my shoulder the whole time I was talking to her. She wasn't even listening to anything. Artie? Never mind. Uh, hey, you like my new dress? Got it just for the... Cute? Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna go get a drink. Do you want one? Oh, you did? Did you get me one? Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw him. And honestly, I, I, I don't care. <gasps> oh my god! <laughs> Stop! Oh, stop. Seriously, somebody will see us. Oh my gosh, you're so bad. Oh, thank you. Mm. You like it? Really? Oh, thanks. I do kind of feel sexy in it. <laughs> oh, don't. Seriously, look, Sandy's going to see us. Stop. Come on. Besides, I have to go do an interview about how perfect my life is with Artie. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Gotta put my game face on. Wish me luck. Red, red wine. Red, red wine, you make me feel so fine. Keep me happy all of the time. <laughs> Does anybody even really like that song? I mean, it's good to dance to, and it's got a great message. <laughs> but it's like you hear it once and it gets stuck in your head forever. It's like it makes me like it. <laughs> or like I make myself like it. Maybe because I like red wine so much. <laughs> and yes, it does make me feel so very, very fine. <laughs> mm. Kind of makes me feel powerful, you know? Like, like I could do anything, or be anything, or do anyone. Oh, <laughs> oops. Liquid courage, right? Cheers to that. <laughs> it's not like I need the wine. I just like to drink it. I work really hard and I don't have many vices, so I, I kind of feel like I deserve it in a way. And if I ever felt like I needed it, which I don't, then I'd stop. Don't worry, I know the difference between my wants and my needs. I'm very in touch with myself. <laughs> yeah, very. <laughs> You're bad. So am I. But you knew that, didn't you? Most people don't. They think I'm all sugar and spice. <laughs> you like watching me, don't you? Oh, I know, I know. I'm so needy. Validate me, validate me. <laughs> oh, fuck. Okay, how about I'll just shut my mouth and let you, you know, make me feel better. Just don't tell on me, okay? I'm standing in the lobby. 
The sounds and the smells from the cafe make my stomach churn and I feel queasy. I guess I'm just excited. Dread and anticipation, aren't those the same thing? Settle into my stomach and harden my guts into a singular noun, gut. I have gut rock. I'm still wrapped up in my coat and hat and gloves and they are shielding me from the, pe from the accusatory gaze of the middle-aged waitress who keeps peering up at me through her clumpy eyelashes and the faux ferns, trying to penetrate my anonymity and my sanity. Or maybe she just likes my new coat. It is white and wool and has leather accents, and I pull it tighter around myself as I shiver and sweat rolls down the small of my back. A gust of cold wind hits my face, and I look up and see a short little man in a long camel coat much too long for him walk to the desk to check in, and I can't catch my breath. It got sucked out the door, so I really can't breathe. The clumpy-faced waitress is laughing at me with contempt that she hides in mascara and ferns that are not only plastic but dusty as well. The short long coat man turns and catches my eye and I scream but there's no one to hear me. The elevator people are doing their dance in and out, up and down. The diners are dining. The bellhops are jumping to make one more loony. The waitress is smirking. The desk clerks are typing. The short man's now laughing too loudly and patting the back of the concierge. And I can't stop screaming, but nobody's listening, especially not me. So I smile hard instead. Then I pick up my purse and I follow the short little man in the really long coat. This is it. And we join the two people who hold the door open. How fun. And he pushes the seven. So lucky. And we all watch the door as it shuts us inside. And I have to remember to breathe in and out and to smile really hard and above all, have fun. We get to the room, number 714, and he looks up at me and the first words he says are, hi there. And I wave down at him like a moron and slouch so I don't scare him away. And the room is all shaggy and brown and smells musty and old, just like him. And I smile and laugh and say, hi. And the next thing I know, I am sprawled on the bed and I stare at his boots as he's undoing his belt, which is cinching his jeans much too high on his waist, like a dorky old man, which he is. And I feel really scared. Submitting instead of admitting the fear that is buried in dust covered lust and desire. I give myself up to him. That's what he wants, so I'm sure I do too. But after I give and receive all of that, all I want is to run down the stairs to the waitress and bury myself in her powdery cleavage to hide from myself and from men in long coats. But I smile and nod. Yes, I loved it. And musty brown air chokes my throat, bringing tears to my eyes, which I hide in goodbye and wade down deep inside of my gut rock and step out the door. I'm sitting in the lobby. I smile at the waitress who squints disapprovingly, scratching her nipple like no one is looking. My hand reaches out to wipe dust from the plants that are plastic. I can't help myself as I stare at that grayness that smudges my fingertips. How about that soul? And I shove them all into my mouth and I suck off the grit and the dust tastes like nothing, which makes me laugh harder. It's nothing which feels so familiar and gray and a gust of cold wind hits my face as I walk out the door. Hi, Mom. Yeah, I just had lunch with him at his hotel. Yeah, it was great. No, Artie wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, he's coming to see the show. Yeah, maybe it'll lead to an audition or something. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mom. Bye.
other day, I met this really cute guy at a Bix Pickles audition. <laughs> we talked for an hour about everything. Things like my friends are cheating on their spouses and both of them are confiding in me. Like I used to suffer from terrible stage fright. Like I'm scared I'm not really the person I'm supposed to be. I don't know if I even understood what I was saying at the time. I just knew that I felt safe. And that was a new feeling. We went into the audition room, and he rescued me, which he was supposed to, and he kissed me. Then we came out, and he encouraged me to write for myself, which I did. And we also started writing to each other. He gave me everything. His fears, his regrets, his shame. And that trust opened something in me. So when he told me that all of me was worth loving, I believed him. And when he told me that I was beautiful, I saw myself through his eyes. And for the first time I could remember, I liked what I saw. He asked me questions that made me question everything. And I told him things I had never told anyone, secrets I had carried with me my whole life. And he just held me very gently in the palms of his hands and said, why? I know what this is. I know with a certainty deep in my bones. I love him, but I don't know what to do. I've been convincing my, myself that living two lives is normal. Like, like I do all this awful stuff down here so that I can be what everybody needs me to be up here. And as long as nobody finds out, then everything's fine. So down here, I'm puking my guts out, I'm smoking and drinking and, and, and sleeping with any guy who says I'm cute and that's normal? Walking around with this, this rock of fear in my stomach my whole life, normal? Being afraid that if anyone found out my secrets, I would die. I wanted to die. I was killing myself and no one noticed. No one except my beautiful pickle man, he noticed. But what am I supposed to do? I can't just throw away my whole life. I mean, my marriage, my career, my family, my friends were all enmeshed in this, this web. I can't just tear it apart. But to carry on as I have, I mean, I might as well. I, I don't want to be afraid anymore. I want to be accepted for who I am. I, I have a choice. <laughs> I have a choice. <laughs> this is who I am. This is what I want. This is who I love. And I want, I want Lance. And you know what? His name isn't really Lance. It's Wes. And my name's not really Gwyn. It's Sarah. It's nice to finally meet you. Excuse me. <clears throat> Hi, Mom. It's me. Princess, dressed in my best, smiling for you, the way that you want me to. See me, sweet as hard candy, cracking with shame. Do you even know my name? Hit me, so I'm not pretty frozen inside. My smile is the place I hide. Each day, putting me on display, all you can see is the way that you package me. Oh my, my, set me free. Why can't you see me? 
Oh my, my, set me free. Oh, why can't you see me? Do you believe in fairy tales? 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 One day, a traveling minstrel came to the castle and performed a song for the court. The princess was moved by the beauty of his playing and asked to see him alone. She sat on her throne, waiting for him to address her, but he just looked very closely at her until her face grew hot beneath the mask. Why do you wear that mask, princess? he asked. Why? I have to. It gives everyone in the kingdom such pleasure. They see the mask, not you. No one knows who you are. Isn't that lonely? Something came alive inside her then, and the princess cried and cried until the flood of her tears opened a tiny crack in her mask. She tried to turn away and hide, but the minstrel held her face in his hands and looked at her through the crack. I see you, he said and knelt down in front of her. I love you, my princess. I have nothing to offer you but my voice and ask for nothing but yours in return. If you feel as I do, meet me tonight outside the castle walls without your mask. The princess was more afraid than ever for she knew that she did love him too, knew what that meant that nothing could ever be the same. That night, she took a needle and pricked her finger. She picked up a quill and dipped it into her blood then closed her eyes. Her hand had a life of its own. She looked to see what she had written. This is not you. She looked up at the golden mirror and beheld the mask's reflection and knew it was true. She was very afraid for her existence within the castle was all she had ever known. But she took a deep breath, stepped through the gate, and the castle door slammed shut behind her forever. The minstrel was waiting. He held out his hand. She took off her mask, looked at him, saw herself through his eyes, and when he said, you were beautiful, she realized she was saying it along with him. Something was moving inside her. The diamond had broken, and all of her tears flowed up from within her and poured out of her eyes. And then they were an ocean, and she was swimming, still crying, but laughing now too, the sound of her heart in her ears. And she lived. Sarah Murphy Dyson. Yeah.